to welcome a very esteemed panel of speakers onto the stage, starting with Mr. Mahesh Jai Singh, partner, Deloitte Touche Tomatsu India, LLP. And now that we have the panel set, we would like to begin the technical session. I would like to request Mr. Mahesh Jai Singh, partner, Deloitte Touche Tomatsu India, LLP, to please deliver his address. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for having me over. It's an honor and privilege to be with the esteemed co-panelists. Uh, I'm not sure whether my inputs would anywhere close to match up with any of them, but let me make my best effort. Uh, I was, in a way, thinking what, what should the focus be, because when we want to talk about international practices, uh, the journey of GST, and today has been a hugely insightful day for me uh, and all of us with uh, Mr. Shah and Mr. Modi and also, of course, Mr. Bajaj, each one talking so much about the journey on GST. But that itself was one of the most important starting point of moving to an international-based VAT system. Uh, I've had the honor and privilege to uh, work and interact with Mr. Nagendra Kumar even before GST, when the conceptualization was happening after the constitutional amendment in 2009, and then, uh, you know, 2017, we all know, we're going to turn five years soon as GST. The reason I'm emphasizing that, not to jog our memory too much there, but when we are at this cusp of five years when a child is effectively getting out completely of infancy, and I've got a daughter at that age, so it's you can relate that they start getting more mature on many different things. So when we are at that cusp, what can we focus on and what is industry hoping? Uh, I can give an industry perspective and we'll have the benefit of uh, our other esteemed panelists, especially Mr. Nagendra Kumar, sir, to share a government perspective and we'll have uh, Justice's inputs from a legal and my colleague Syed as well from an international standpoint. So I thought of five areas for GST at five, because uh, we are four months away, uh, we've settled on, on different aspects of teething troubles, the technology platform of the government is uh, far superior than what even industry has been able to uh, get. So in that backdrop, let me focus on five areas. One, what we've seen I'm not going to get into rate of tax, specific tax issues. That's not what I thought from an international tax standpoint. I think what's happening is area one is working capital it seems to be building up and getting built for companies. The government, particularly of late and very recently in the budget, uh, has re-emphasized the impetus on capital's expenditure. The amount of spend on the PLI uh, incentives is hugely commendable and the investment is happening. So on one end, when we are expanding our Make in India platform and also uh, focusing on capital expenditure, there's one area that I think will unlocking of GST credits for non-exporters because the GST law is well designed to cover for an exporter to claim refunds. I'm hoping in the next few years, as we turn into five, we are seeing some changes around that. Three specific areas that I thought could be considered and keeping in light of the, uh, my theme for today of international practices is clubbing of credits. CGST is a central GST. Technically, it's one statute. And even I may have operations in 10 states. The government has already taken a commendable step of clubbing CGST cash uh, in my balance. Can we look at CGST credit balance is being consolidated with appropriate guardrails. Each suggestion can have enough and more guardrails. I'm sure industry will welcome that. Second, international concept, particularly in Europe, has grouping of credits and you know a group system, which is then income tax as well as indirect tax. Uh, that's something that we could look at. We have robust definitions of related party under GST law as well as customs. Um, we could borrow from that and perhaps even build up to ensure there's no misuse and start off with bigger uh, thresholds so that it's controlled like the LTU concept was also a beautifully tried tested. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the first LTU commissioner in India on indirect tax was Mr. Nagendra Kumar. So I, uh, I think that's going to be an important and easy precedent to replicate. We can look at transfer of credits on script basis, but I'll reserve that for another day. 
In interest of time, I can see I've got about five and a half minutes. Uh, other suggestions, again, aligning to global principle is ease of doing business. So when I say ease of doing business is a non-revenue impact, I don't think uh, any recommendations can be made. Mr. Bajaj very painstakingly explained the economics from a taxation law standpoint, how the government is quite constrained uh, while there were intentions to reduce some slabs. So therefore, only focusing on no, uh, without a revenue impact, one option is to look at can reverse charge be paid using my input tax credit pool. So uh, this is again something that's there in Europe, Singapore and Australia and others. Especially in Europe, if you are uh, running a business that is a fully taxable business and not like oil and gas, healthcare, education, or perhaps banking in those countries, but India, our financial services, uh, I'll, I'll pack that aside. Those exceptions can be made, but for other businesses, say somebody's a service exporter sitting on a lot of, lot of credit, why constantly pay and then burden the administration for further refunds? So that's an area that we could consider. Uh, we've off late seen the deemed supply concept for import of services. I think there can be an ease of business clarification of what is the deemed supply. Deemed supply was a concept that existed more in customs law and we're bringing it into GST. Uh, it's also been brought in more for import of goods and I think services has come in. Uh, I'm sure the genesis of it can be explained. But I do think if a clarification can be issued because that will avoid painstaking litigation and dispute where the government actually is not getting uh, total revenue. The revenue is not there because it's revenue neutral. Of course, one more path, uh, step forward is to see why have this provision where a company can claim full credit. So that's something that I will request if that can be kindly considered by the GST Council and the GST Policy Wing. Uh, theme C is really removing credit restrictions. So we are uh, at the cusp, and uh, Mr. Bajaj was explaining about how the r, &R rate, uh, and Mr. Modi as well, that it's around 11.2 to 11.3. It ex was earlier expected at 15.3. I'm not going there. I'm sure the GOM and the Honorable Ministers and the uh, GST Council will get to the right rate. But when we are at that fifth year cusp, and that rate is all up for review, should we be reconsidering the restrictions that has been placed uh, particularly for certain capital good related credit, particularly in the backdrop, like I said, where the government is pushing hard and supporting capital build for businesses like logistics, uh, supply chain related, telecom, e-commerce and others where so much of spend is there. Maybe we start by few sectors so there's no misuse because I do understand the interplay with uh, immovable property, but I'll keep that aside. I think that's a recommendation that I'm hoping works because again worldwide there are very limited to no restrictions and that can be factored in the larger scheme of the new rate uh, uh, so that the government is not out of cash on that. Uh, people are clearly the assets of business. Uh, the pandemic has taught us some hard lessons uh, and I think the law however does have restriction on credit for personal consumption. Uh, I would just log the point that there are a lot of I mean with people being the assets expenses on the people, whether it is COVID vaccine reimbursements or different related COVID precautions and others, as we all go back to the hybrid model, can be kindly considered. The last two recommendations is assisting the growth of MSME sector. Uh, I think clearly the government has been pushing hard with the MSME ministry, very obsessed to help the sector. There are a few GST parity issues that you can't go online and make a sale unless you take a full registration if you're a below threshold or composition dealer. So I think time is ripe to address that with full guardrails where only local sales can be made by those sellers on the platform. And the platform, who's a very powerful ally to the government, the e-commerce sector, I did start off saying the government did on technology is really up there. I think a lot of sectors are very powerful allies and e-commerce is one of them where the data is given. That data can be further refined and submitted to protect any concerns, whether on the local and interstate supplies. Uh, I do think MSME as well as, it sort of goes to my last theme, theme five, on implementation on GST, that some of the suspension and cancellation, I think should be done. I'm, I keep reading about fake invoices. As just an Indian and as a citizen, I'm proud of my administration catching all these uh, fraudulent cases because that 
increases the tax buoyancy, it reduces the strain on the government to go after tax positions, but there can be a balanced, a slightly nuanced uh, 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 to a approach to the current one, where suspensions happen after a hearing is given, and also we embrace a new age setup where I can be sitting out of a co-working space and running a business. I don't need to have, if I have operations in 20 states, 20 offices and rent and 20 employees. So that's uh, really what I wanted to say. Uh, last point on implementation, I know I've busted my 10 minutes, is that the uh, policy wing has been issuing clarifications and the council is proactively issuing. There are contentious advance rulings that are issued. I'm hoping that uh, there, are, there is continued and enhanced either public rulings as well as clarifications on these matters. Also, we've seen awesome circulars, a recent path-breaking one is on the export one on intermediary. If we're able to see a better implementation mechanism and the public ruling one, I was talking to uh, Mr. Garg as well, there are other countries that have uh, done that. It's, so this international experience can be comfortably implemented. So that's what I had, uh, and I'm going to pause here. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing your insights on the issue. That was Mr. Mahesh Jessing, partner Deloitte Touche Tomatsu India LLP. Moving on, I would now like to invite Mr. N.P. Nagendra Kumar, member GST CBIC, to please share his thoughts on the subject. Good evening, everyone. Uh, at the outset, I must express my sincere gratitude to uh, TIOL, uh, particularly to Mr. Shailendra, for inviting me to be a part of the panel member in this discussion, drawing international experience on GST in the Indian context. Uh, looking back into the GST journey in our country for over four and a half years, I think particularly looking into the point at which we started when we drafted the GST law, I think we took a lot of uh, uh, inputs into the provisions of the GST law prevailing world over. Particularly, we looked at the UK VAT model, also the Singaporean VAT, and also looked into the Australian GST when we drafted our GST law. The challenge for us was with regard to how do we move from an origin-based taxation to a destination-based taxation, and that at a sub-national level. I think that is where the international experience gave us a lot of input. The dual GST model, what we have envisaged, and the IGST model, which we adopted in terms of ensuring that the sub-national tax happens without much of credit accumulation and credit blocking. That is where we started with in our journey as far as GST is concerned. Now, one of the important things in the GST in the last four and a half years is the learning. I think Mahesh has rightly put it, that it has become a completely electronically administered tax. In that sense, it took some time for both the tax administration as well as the tax payers to absorb those changes which came in a very quick succession, be it in obtaining the registration or filing the tax returns or making payments. I think the entire process is completely guided by the GST network. Uh, we are not denying the fact that the network had its initial challenges in terms of the glitches, etc. But since the timeline available to them for set in motion, these processes were very short, it was expected. But over a period of time, with the able guidance of the GST Council, so far as making the policy tweaks and the changes happening, both in terms of improving the compliance and also improving the facilitation in terms of uh, easing the compliance burden, I think the GST has traveled a long way. Uh, insofar as drawing the international experience is concerned, I think we are very conscious of the fact that we need to take it further in terms of how do we ensure the seamless flow of the input as credit. I think Mahesh mentioned about the restriction which we have built in and some of the provisions which are working in terms of uh, not achieving those objectives. Uh, the another aspect what we have experienced in our GST implementation is with regard to ensure how we prevent fraudulent input as credit. I think this is where some of the initiatives which India experimented with in terms of completely adopting an e-way bill, uh, in terms of monitoring the movement of the goods uh, interstate and intrastate. Uh, so also with regard to how do we adopt technology, the tax technology in terms of invoicing. These are the two measures have today contributed immensely in ensuring that the oversight and the monitoring happens with regard to GST compliance with less intrusiveness 
less pain point to the business. At the same time, provides the tax administration with the required critical data on a near real-time basis to ensure that the tax compliance is on board. Uh, this also has its own challenges in terms of absorption time for the taxpayers. I think uh, one typical uh, refrain which we have heard and of course we have taken note of is the frequent changes which we have brought in in terms of the circulars and the notifications. Mind you, when we started the GST uh, on 1st July 2017, over 1200 items on which the tax rates were to be fixed, taking into account the prevalent rate which was applicable from the VAT legislations and also from the central excise and service tax was an uphill task. The revenue secretary in the morning in the forenoon session as well as Phil Modi, the then deputy chairman and also the convener of the empowered committee of state finance ministers did make a mention about how the rate in real incidence of indirect tax in the GST regime has come down from the 15.6% to 15.3% to 11.6%. Those giveaway of 92,000 crores had had its own pressure on the revenues. But even today, I think we are living with that type of a rate and we are seeing the positive growth in the GST revenue. I think that is partly because of the compliance improvement which we see all around because of the adoption of technology and better administrative tools in terms of the risk-based interventions that the tax authorities have been employing uh, in ensuring that the tax revenues are adequately safeguarded. Uh, I was talking about the, uh, the experiment with regard to e-invoice. Uh, we started introduction of the invoice somewhere in the 1st of October 2020. Uh, we have also seen the invoice in various countries, including particularly we have been quite uh, observant about the success which has had in South Korea. Uh, the B2B transactions, which are now currently up to the threshold of 50 crore turnover, which is in the invoice, has been uh, a very uh, satisfying experience. We are into uh, less than about, uh, 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 I would say that from 2020 to now, we have hardly about, uh, had about 15, 16 months of experience. But the, uh, the amount of information which is available to the tax administration on real-time basis, also the backward linkage to the businesses in ensuring this invoice could be integrated into their business processes for payment and also the, their vendor uh, settlement has been paving the way in sense that this only is not only helping the tax compliance, but also helping them integrating their business processes to tax compliance as well. Now, uh, going forward, I think we need to look at how do we address the concerns of certain segments and take the draw from the international experience. Mayesh did mention about the pain points which the MSME sector has been experiencing. What we have observed in the first two and two, three years of uh, introduction of the GST is the formalization which happened, and that formalization that by and large benefited the large enterprises which had the wherewithal to invest and also adopt the tax technology in a quick time frame. Now, some of the initiatives which have been taken uh, post 37th GST Council meeting, insofar as the MSMEs are concerned by relaxing the filing norm from the monthly return to the quarterly return and also providing uh, very liberalized threshold limits in terms of both composition threshold as well as for the tax exemption threshold also providing relaxations and certain key compliance requirements in terms of filing of annual returns, etc. I think our effort is towards easing the compliance burden of the MSMEs. But the challenge will be for us, the MSME sectors cannot be looked upon in isolation. They do interact with large businesses for whom the credit flow will have to happen in a seamless manner. At the same time, they are also into the uh, issue with regard to how do their turnovers get monitored. Now, this is an area in which I think our effort will continue to be there. The quarterly return payment, uh, the quarterly return with the monthly payment is one what we thought of in the interregnum. Now, we are looking at how do we proceed further in further uh, uh, easing the burden of compliance for the MSMEs. Uh, Mahesh also mentioned about how do we deal with the digital supplies and also particularly with regard to the e-commerce, which is contributing largely in terms of providing services and products across the uh, electronic network. Uh, some of the uh, design issues which I think Mahesh touched upon with regard to the threshold exemption not being there, the mandatory registration requirements, uh, the co-working spaces where probably your principal place of business may not be existing in the physical term like what it could be in terms of the physical infrastructure, etc. I think our conscious endeavor will be towards addressing those concerns the time to come. Uh, with adoption of technology, 
and uh, with an experience what we have gained in the last four and a half years in implementing the GST, I think what we look forward in future is to look at the B2B transaction, as rightly said, it should be completely business neutral. Uh, we do appreciate that in terms of providing that comfort to our registrants who are intermediaries in collecting the taxes and remitting to the government, we need to acknowledge the fact that they do not end up with any attached cost in terms of the blocking of the credits or for that matter, food compliance burden. Uh, but going forward, we need to look at further with regard to the tax compliance at a B2C level. Uh, this is something which I think we need to think through. The international experience will come quite handy to us so far as seeing how does the B2C transactions are addressed. Are addressed. There are sectors internationally have been found to be uh, uh, risky for the tax administration, particularly in the restaurant and uh, the sectors. We won't like to look at those experiences as well. But more importantly, what we could look upon is in drawing the international experience, sustaining the GST reform further, is how do we look at ensuring this, the collection of taxes happens with least burden, and at the same time, I think the government gets the revenue in a timely manner. Uh, conclusively, I would say that, concluding my remark, I think at a subnational level, taxing both goods and services, moving the central tax administration from the manufacturing bat to the retail level, providing a single interface in terms of an administrative structure, and ensuring timely refunds, I think we are there in towards that momentous occasion for ensuring that the GST reform here provides much simpler days to come. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. D.P. Nagendra Kumar, member GST-CBIC, sharing his thoughts on the panel, international bad experiences, relevance for Indian GST. And now it's time we move across to Washington, where we are being joined by Mr. S.C. Ahmed, professor from London School of Economics. Mr. S.C. Ahmed. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to um, talk to you today. It's uh, almost uh, 40 years since we be I began to work on the Indian tax system in 1980 with Lord Stern. And I was a fellow at the NIPFP with Rajan Chalaya. And we began to uh, ba basically make a case for the VAT GST uh, at that time. And some of the analytic work and also the empirical work done in India in the 1980s with Stern and the book that I published with him uh, in 1991 on theory and practice of tax reform actually was very helpful in looking at the actual experiences in a couple of countries I'd like to talk about. One is Mexico and the other one is China. And I was involved in the introduction of the VAT slash GST in, uh, in China and reform of the VAT uh, in, in Mexico. Now, the focus by my colleagues in the international agencies on revenue is, is exactly right, but it's not sufficient. What one ha also has to be looking at is the effects on producers, on income distribution and the environment of all taxes. So really any tax reform is also necessary to look at the institutional arrangements in a country. And in the problem in South Asia is that most of the countries are constrained by constitutional arrangements which go back to the Government of India Act of 1935. So the assignments basically are, are a major constraint. And India has made substantive uh, efforts to uh, break out of the constraints. Pakistan has gone in the wrong direction, uh, accentuating the differences between goods and services, giving services to the subnational level of administration. And that has led to no increase in revenues, no increase in efficiency. And clearly there are problems with income distribution as well. The problem is that you can't address all of these objectives with one tax instrument. And really what one should be looking at for overall design issue is the interaction between taxes and between taxes and transfer design. I broaden the perspective uh, and of course it's very difficult to do in a 
in, 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 given the constitutional constraints in India, but let me talk about how the Chinese managed to do precisely uh, address this reform. They started off with all administration at the subnational level and no VAT. This is 1993. And when they it's basically decided to go for a new tax system because the tax GDP ratio had collapsed to 10% from around 30 in the early 1980s, they were in serious trouble. So they decided to create a national tax administration from scratch to administer the VAT, which would be shared on an origin basis with the subnational governments. In, in China, they call provinces. But the way that was done was to make sure that no province lost revenues. So there was a stop loss provision. 1993 revenues were guaranteed in perpetuity and they also brought in uh, revenue sharing and an equalization framework. So the tax transfer design issues, opening up the, the, the agenda were critical in getting acceptance even in a centralized unitary state like China. They had to get the agreement of the provinces. The only way they could do that was to make sure that no province lost and every province had uh, an incentive to participate. Now that process initially started with a, they started off with an investment type VAT, uh, which was converted over time into a consumption type VAT. The tax GDP ratio went up from around 10% to now 20% in a very short period of time. But what they were doing was creating a level playing field for the entire country. And the conclusion of this reform, the VAT reform came in 2015, when they integrated the business tax, which was man managed by the provinces, equivalent to the states, on services with the national VAT to be administered by the national VAT, national tax administration. So basically creating a unified tax administration with a unified base. Now, what was the effect of that? they were able to remove the borders around the special economic zones. It didn't really matter where you produced as long as you could get your full refunds on export. So basically they were creating the incentives to move production away from the special economic zones that had become along the coast, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, uh, Shanghai had become too big. Uh, with huge environmental uh, damage, with huge income inequality. Now that was the integration of the VAT creating a level playing field. And the critical element is that you are able to move beyond a special economic zone. And that is the core for the development of now the new uh, high-tech zones, which also will entail changes in institutional arrangements, which is very hard to do because uh, you know changing boundaries, as you know, in India is almost impossible. Likewise in Europe. It may be somewhat easier, but it's not easy in China either. But looking at the investment that's necessary for the high-tech zones, the integration across jurisdictions and creation of new uh, high-tech, uh, uh, the, the Greater Bay Area, for example. The issue really turns on what then happens to the tax uh, powers of the states. And you need an own source of revenues for the provinces or a state and local governments. And you know, if you have a harmonized base and harmonized rates to ease the cost of doing business, reduce the cost of doing business and create a, a common framework for investment then it's not so easy to ask uh, subnational jurisdictions to raise the rates or change the basis. And nor does it make much sense to do to have then multiple administrations. But you do need an own source revenue. And one of the options that one is looking at in the Chinese case is integrating the income taxes and giving a piggyback on the income tax to provinces and reforming the property tax 
for cities and metropolitan areas. I'm not going to talk about this second set of issues, but what I, is essential to keep in mind is that own source revenue, which means that you have control over the rate at the margin, is essential for accountability and for access to private finance for states and for cities. And really multiple tax rates uh, and differential bases for the, for the GST don't do that, especially if you have constraints in the way you set up your, uh, your, uh, your tax uh, policy framework. Now a lesson in Mexico. In Mexico, try to fix the VAT after, you know, what they had done after NAFTA was to give tax exemptions and create uh, special rates for border regions uh, and create the huge Maquila Dora zone in the north to facilitate trade with the United States. So the Maquila Dora zone and then extensions of uh, exemptions, special rates for distributional purposes and for investment essentially meant that the, their VAT uh, did not raise revenues and became basically a mechanism for cheating. And who was cheating? All the large firms were cheating and they were able to cheat with a high registration threshold by hiding their transactions uh, and by basically uh, being able to shift profits into the Maquila Dora zone. Successive ministers tried to fix the VAT but could not do so because you have gainers and losers with any reform. There are gainers in terms of states, the gainers in terms and losers in terms of industries and households, of course, you have distributional considerations as well. But they learned from the Chinese and they learned that the VAT reform can't be done if you're only looking at the VAT in isolation. So they put together a package of reforms in, 19, in 2013, uh, which effectively dropped the registration threshold to zero, integrating the small taxpayer regime, which was managed by the states into the national VAT, creating a national VAT. SAT, which was the tax administration, could audit any firm, regardless of size, and providing e requiring e-invoicing uh, and giving uh, electronic uh, packages to small taxpayers so that they could issue electronic invoices completely changed uh, the structure of, uh, uh, of incentives and the ability of large firms to hide transactions. Large firms were able to hide transactions by hiding labor, hiding output, and profits. So they're able to, to save on the payroll tax, on the VAT, on the income taxes. So that was how the cheating took place. You block the ability to uh, transact with firms that are off the radar of the tax administration and the large taxpayer unit really becomes affected. It doesn't otherwise. So the tax GDP ratio in Mexico following this reform, which was a package of reforms, wasn't just the, the VAT. Uh, or the GST, they don't call it the GST, they call it the VAT, I'm using the term interchangeably, was that they were able then to block the cheating by the large taxpayers. And that led to a tax GDP ratio going up from 10 to 15% in about three years time. This was during the Peña Nieto administration. But it was done again by offsetting gainers and losers, making sure that no firms uh, well, clearly some firms would lose because they were no longer able to cheat, but they were creating a level playing field. And what was the impact of that? Well, there was a huge increase in foreign direct investment throughout the country. Wherever they had infrastructure, it was no longer necessary to invest only in the northern Maquila Dorison. So you had huge investment in automobiles, aerospace, uh, all sorts of uh, uh, medium tech and high tech industry in cities uh, around the country where they had infrastructure. So the issue really then turned on infrastructure, uh, local provision of services for firms to want to move and for qualified labor to want to move. So basically 
with the VAT, you create a level playing field and actually it works. And that reform in 2013 is what the Chinese looked at when they integrated their uh, small taxpayer regime uh, and also the uh, taxes on services with the tax on goods. So really doing the opposite of what the Pakistanis have gone and done, which is further segregate uh, goods and services and give services stupidly to the states or the provinces. Can't be done. So really, uh, I think the lesson is that if you're integrating for efficiency, you're integrating the VAT for ease of doing business and for reducing cheating, uh, fake invoicing, you have to create a common framework. And if it's a common framework with minimal uh, variation across states for ease of doing business, then it makes no sense to have multiple administrations. But then you still need something for the states. And I think that's something which, you know, the finance commissions could usefully in future, I mean, this is something that we had recommended to uh, the finance commission in 2009, 10, that don't just look at VAT in isolation, but look at the VAT together with uh, assignments on revenue sharing from the income taxes and clean up the property tax for, uh, for cities. So really think of a, 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 a composite set of reforms together with uh, reforms in the transfer design issues for sustainable growth, for looking at environmental, I mean, this, this uh, comments earlier on that the environment may create uh, regulations and costs for doing business. It doesn't have to be that way. And by simplifying the VAT, you create the basis for investment and employment generation to be guided by public investment decisions, to be guided by the design of intergovernmental transfers, creation of uh, an equalization framework. Here you now have a compensation for, uh, for VAT reforms almost on a discretional basis. It should be automatic. So basically, if you're looking at subnational revenue sharing, there should be no discretionality in that. And this is a lesson that the Chinese have learned, but revenue sharing is not sufficient because national governments reduce taxes. If you reduce taxes for macro reasons or for economic shock, then that imposes a huge burden on subnational governments. Therefore, own source of revenues, particularly of a, a tax uh, base that they can use efficiently, like the income tax, as in the United States or in uh, many parts of the world, is perhaps a better instrument than splitting the, the, the GST base. So I'll stop there. I think really what one, one has is lessons from India or the research on India used in actual reforms in, in China and in Mexico with, you know, coming back again, you know, some of their experiences perhaps can provide some options for the future finance commissions uh, or the government going forward with a sustainable growth agenda to address both the pandemic and climate change without adding to the cost of doing business, the VAT plays a major role. And a clean, compact, uh, transparent uh, uh, e tax that, that reduces the cost of doing business is absolutely critical. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Mr. S.C. Ahmed. That was Mr. S.C. Ahmed, Professor from London School of Economics, joining us from Washington at this time. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us, despite such a huge time difference. Really, really a privilege to have you with us today. And now that we have all the panelists have given their speeches and their addresses on this, I now request the chair of this session, Justice Godara Guram, to please sum it up and give his concluding remarks for the session. Thank you. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be, to be in connecting with Nagendra Kumar and Jay Singh, who I had met earlier when I was in Bhopal. And uh, it was such a pleasure and a privilege to hear Professor Ahmed. Uh, 
uh, who had a academic uh, fecundity on the topic. Uh, I'm not much into the technical aspects of law since uh, nearly a year now, I have uh, moved away from law in its technical sense, but connecting again, uh, I'll just share a few thoughts that for about four or five years while I was the high court bench, I had occasional opportunities to deal with the uh, VAT in the context of uh, sales tax of the state and occasionally service tax, which was by then about half a decade old. Uh, then for three years, I had intensely to work on service tax after a decade of its introduction. And I found that uh, tax administrators were genetically programmed to list one and list two, each trying to uh, increase their harvest of the revenue, regardless of the constitutional boundaries of list one and list two. And uh, these included not only the tax administrators, but also the uh, revenue representatives in the tribunal where I was working at that time. Uh, so much so that uh, I was being uh, almost accused of an unconstitutional uh, mindset towards the adjudication of service tax. Be that as it may. Now that the 101st Amendment has come nearly five years ago, it requires another genetic mutation, both for the practitioners as well as for the tax administration. And it also requires that we should be globally tuned and more integrated with the global substantive and procedural practices because the world requires to be united now on occasions other than conflict and COVID-19. These have a pandemic effect, global conflicts and uh, pandemics. But otherwise, even for harvesting of tax revenues equitably, gainfully, and sustainably, we require to have an integration of global models. OECD is doing a wonderful work in this area. And uh, we are also learning because one thing I noticed uh, at very abstract level is that economic interests make people saner. There was a time in the 18th and pre 18th and 19th centuries when uh, uh, imperialistic tendencies were there, where there was a hunger for land and expansionism, uh, which is there to a very small measure in a few countries, but by and large, you know, we have mankind has gone beyond that stage. Now the economic interests make us saner. And that is why I notice uh, in a near 50 years association with law, that instead of being an imperial imposition by tax administrators, now there's a consultative process between the consumer, the taxpayer, the generator of the revenue, the harvester of the revenue, the policy maker, and that's a good thing. And uh, uh, what we gather from the international perspectives uh, for uh, the Indian GST relevance has been very ably uh, you know, brought out by Professor Ahmad and uh, Mr. Mahesh and uh, Professor Nagendra Kumar. There's not much that I wish to or could add to that. I would only say that uh, we need to have, see, I noticed in a general perspective in my engagement with law, that the problem of uh, policy making translating into statute law or substatute law is the limitations of the human foresight, the limitations of the inevitable limitations of the language in which the policy is formulated which has ambiguities which require interpretive dynamics and the gap in the understanding of the administrator of law and the increasing disrespect of 
the citizen or the individual towards the policy because of its asymmetric and disproportionate administrative outcomes. And uh, while general society goes from a state of equilibrium to disequilibrium very fast because of these uh, maladies, in tax administration could, could have very severe consequences on the economy. And uh, economy is very important now uh, and is growing in importance because uh, while uh, governments are accused of uh, increasing and exponentially increasing hunger in harvesting revenues, the outlays are also very complex. Not only do we have to develop and bring uh, many of our people out of uh, their poverty line and uh, economic uh, deprivation, but we also have to invest a lot in uh, building our international image that costs a lot of money. Uh, this is uh, political PR uh, at a global level. Also, we need to militarize uh, because the world is increasing, getting unpeaceful, though we are living as uh, Steven Pinker points out in the most peaceful times in recorded human history, uh, barring the second global conflict in the 1930s, uh, the world has been fairly peaceful. But nevertheless, the tensions are there. Uh, Post-nuclear uh, races are there, which require huge investments uh, for the military regime. And this requires a huge outlay from the uh, action, uh, from the exchequer. And therefore, revenue harvesting becomes very critical. How do we harvest competently, fairly, equitably, and uh, not pinch only those who are compliant. And that as the other day, I was having a conversation with uh, some people who are buying some flats and apartments. And they told me that today, you know, nobody is taking, uh, everybody is taking in checks and drafts, uh, big builders. I said, how does it, uh, today politics is, uh, effective politics is increasingly expensive. Um, uh, how is that being uh, funded if uh, nobody is, uh, uh, if everybody is doing it only in the official currency, they told me that they have devised a method, construction industry, they have devised a method where they take it only in, uh, you know, in the uh, legal tender from the buyer, but in the construction costs from um, uh, subcontracts, uh, they make it up. Uh, that poses a challenge. If you have to reach that uh, uh, sector and segment, it poses a challenge, but again, there'll be resistance from the uh, policy makers because um, their lubrication will uh, you know, dry up. Uh, so these are all competing challenges in a complex polity. The world is growing more and more complex and uh, both the substantive procedural and administrative uh, facets of uh, tax administration and harvesting uh, will have to uh, tune itself to these uh, things. Then GST is a five years is too less a time for uh, mankind to understand a mutant. And uh, GST is a mutant species in our constitutional scheme from list one and list two to some sort of, uh, not a concurrent, but some sort of a hybrid uh, mechanism. So the tax administrators uh, sitting together, particularly in GST council, the state and the central uh, federal administrators, uh, they have to maintain some sort of an equilibrium of conflict, at least on a physical level, uh, though it will take a long training and uh, modulation for them to understand that they are part of uh, a process. GST council has brought about a great change in the federal understanding and federal cooperation. Um, and uh, it's really heartening that despite uh, the differences that we have uh, in political color and uh, uh, rhetoric, GST Council has been uh, not only a physically peaceful arena, but also productive of substantial results. Uh, that is a great achievement. Uh, I'm very grateful to the very, very distinguished panelists, particularly my dear friend, Nagendra Kumar, Mahesh, and uh, the very, very learned Professor Ahmed for making this a very, very fruitful session.
and uh, i think it's more beneficent to have q and a's particularly when mahesh and nagendra are there uh, they are not easy to come by i think the participants uh, the audience must be make take full advantage of these two uh, very profound intellects in the practice of uh, gst and vat thank you Thank you.